Welcome to Elevate Louisiana's Engage Videocast. Elevate Louisiana was founded in 2020 to empower women leaders throughout Louisiana by connecting and educating them on the challenges impacting our state with data-driven nonpartisan solutions to make a better future for Louisiana. Hello. Welcome to Elevate Louisiana's roundtable discussion on the critical workforce shortages Louisiana is facing in its healthcare industry. I'm Julie Stokes, President and CEO of Elevate Louisiana, as well as your host and moderator for today's discussion. Joining us today are Dr. Tina Holland, who's President of Franciscan Ministries of Our Lady University in Baton Rouge, Dr. Wendy Palermo, Chief Education and Training Officer for the Louisiana Community and Technical College System, and Dr. Missy Sparks, Vice President of Talent Management and Workforce Development at Oshner Health. It is always nice to be the least educated woman in the, in the room, <laughs> as I have all of my PhDs in here with me today. Um, so we're just excited to get this conversation off to a start and start envisioning uh, what, what Louisiana can do about this crisis. And, I'd like to just kind of kick it off to Missy. I'm going to drop all the doctors for now, and I'm going to kick it off to Missy, um, who's with Oshner Health, like we talked about, and who can give us some update on what this healthcare crisis looks like right now. Hi, right, great. Thank you so much, Julie. Pleasure to be with you and with Elevate today. And really, many of us have heard the headlines, the great resignation, the pandemic has exacerbated challenges already that had existed in the healthcare workforce, and that many hospitals across the nation are experiencing what they call a crisis in workforce, in workforce right now. The shortage is severe, and there's not enough nurses, not enough lab techs, not enough respiratory therapists or radiologists to meet all the needs of all the hospitals across the U.S. And that has ended up with the additional challenge we face in Louisiana where others come in and say, can we recruit your nurses and put them in agency and take them to another place where they can serve patients elsewhere? And that's what we see happening repeatedly. That challenge is significant because we know by 2029, the demand for healthcare jobs is going to increase by 14%. So we have at the same time people leaving the workforce an increased need. We are in a state that is aging. So we have a real need to retain our current workforce, healthcare workers, and to build more. The pandemic, burnout, early retirement, mental health, these things are all contributing to less workforce. Specifically, 18% of all healthcare workers quit their job during the COVID-19 pandemic. So nearly one in five. We have 40% of our nurses who are over the age of 50 and are looking to retire within the next 15 years. At the same time, Louisiana is going to need more nurses, more healthcare professionals caring for our citizens. So the time is now for us to really critically doubled down on how we build that workforce and how do we partner together with places like Fran U, with Louisiana Community Technical College System, with our other colleges and universities and an industry partnership so that we are robustly addressing the shortage in supply. And, you know, and I, I would say that um, just to tag on to what Missy had said that um, education across the entire continuum, um, K through 12, clear on up through doctoral level prepared professionals who in some way serve the needs of healthcare. That entire continuum is necessary for addressing both the retain and the build. And you might think, oh, well, it's just the, the build part, right? You're this industrial machine that pumps out these trained workers. But instead, you know, the, the, um, what we call our clinical partners, our hiring partners, um, are working with us to uh, meet the professional where they are in their particular field. And then we have to get them onto the, the right 
on-ramp, if you will, into higher education or into a certificate area that's going to advance their career while at the same time meet the critical needs of healthcare. Uh, so, we, and it's not always on a, a real clean continuum. Um, and I think one of the things that we have to stop doing is looking at uh, folks as either college or non-college material, people who are college uh, in their future, or people who don't have college in their future. No, it's what level and at what time and in what way to meet the needs of our community. So when we, and I, I talked to uh, Monty Sullivan at LCTCS and we use the term on a series of on ramps and off ramps. And that's what it is that um, we need to work together to be able to provide. And what's really neat for um, education, especially for higher education, and I'd have to say critical for private higher education, is that um, these partnerships with the hiring partners who might help support the student to complete their education at whatever level it is, and then the student then has an obligation to work with it, to work for the hiring partner that um, has helped in their um, education. I mean, that's how we, that's how we educate officers for the military. I had a five-year commitment after graduating from Annapolis because the taxpayers paid for my, um, my degree. Well, I think, it, and, and we met a critical need. Likewise, our healthcare workers, if they are um, prepared to commit to meeting a critical need, then it's a it's really a um, a win-win situation for the hiring partner then to invest in that student, get them to where they need to be, hire them, and then move them along. Not expect that they're going to be in that position forever. So, but again, it requires that partnership as well. And that's why the uh, four-year institution is especially Fran U is um, highly dependent upon our relationships with the entire LCTCS, all of the two years um, colleges, because we want to be a welcome place for those professionals who have completed either a certificate or degree in the two-year program, and then to advance their careers, perhaps come to us or another four-year institution and advance their careers yet further. So I'm going to jump in here. I, I echo everything you just said, uh, Tina, and of course, Missy. And it's working together in tandem. For LCTCS, it's important for us to work with industry. It's like bridging industry, uh, students in high school, students who exited high school maybe early, and we have them in our adult basic education uh, division where they can earn, Tina, what Dr. Sloan was talking about, an on-ramp credential of value to where they can immediately go out to work earning their their high school equivalency going right to work in a high wage high demand area such as healthcare especially healthcare right now and then while they're working for a premier partner that we have like Archner Health then they can continue and, and they've done a great job in supporting their employees as they return to school to meet the workforce demand and then with us on the other side working with our four year partners like Tina. I know Tina very well and it's important to us that as students earn let's say a technical diploma in LPN and then they they're still working at the bedside and they continue on and earn their RN at the associate degree level and then we encourage them continue earn that baccalaureate degree and I, I think I don't know if everybody knows this but I started with an associate's degree in nursing worked full-time went to school part-time this was long before online education and my employer was phenomenal in that space you know felt the value encouraged education uh, earned a baccalaureate I just continued on a master's in, in nursing education and a PhD all in the state of Louisiana. So whenever I'm talking about this, I'm talking, I'm coming from a place of just personal experience and then being at the community college uh, side of this, seeing an individual, maybe for the first time, their first time graduate of 
high school or college or whatever it is. If you want to have a good time, it's May. Go to a community college graduation event. It is unlike anything you've ever seen. Dr. Holland shared with me, she's speaking at one uh, coming up soon. So, you know, it's important that, and I love the fact, Julie, that you got, you know, industry two year, four year together, because this is not the first time we've met. Uh -uh at all we work together all the time because covid even though we were partners before we had to get super creative well, excuse me for being a sexist here though but notice <laughs> we're all women and we do have this tendency to figure out a way to solve problems by working together none of us are raising our leg and claiming a bush Right. We're all, so sorry for that. I love you, Tina. <laughs> that's, that's essentially what I'm not saying men don't cooperate, but it does seem to be to be um, a, a, I have found it um, not just uh, doable, but really a lot of fun to work with industry partners and um, my educational partners um, who just happen to be fellow um, Women, but it, it's, uh, it's, forgive me for uh, that. Um, <laughs> well, that, uh, well, what I was saying was like, you know, Missy, you came to LCTCS, I'm sure other system and said, I need help and I need you to get creative. And then I go, okay, I need your help. I'm willing to do this and let's skip down this path together. And we've never done this before, but we're willing to try and, and, and also having the support, like specifically, poor Dr. Sullivan, he didn't even know I'm doing this and he's gonna hear his name said over and over. He was supportive of it because right. Missy, you remember when we all went in lockdown and we weren't even allowed in the facilities, we had to go to the regulatory bodies and get creative with simulation and go, okay, we come exactly back with the way. And it, we and we figured it out, and then as soon as the doors opened, you know, we were back in there, and and and, but we had to have the support of those at my. For me personally, was the system office in in doing it, and Dr. Sullivan was like, "Do whatever you think," because it's not it benefits Missy, it doesn't benefit Wendy, it doesn't benefit Tina, it benefits the student, right. it benefits the <laughs> workforce, and it benefits our patients. And our, our, yeah, your patients. Yeah. It's my students, and it's bridging them out of poverty in some cases, mm -hmm. and it's it's bettering our state the health of our state and ultimately our country so i mean if we had to get serious julie we had to get serious for the past two years but i could not have picked a better team to work with at the lctcs and the other four-year partners and of course our industry partners were just i mean you should have seen us julie we were thick as thieves we're all texting calling uh, it was all hands on deck and it, it's a time that i don't want to ever repeat uh, but it oh. really did, you know, iron sharpens iron. That's a proverb. So, you know, now that we've got it kind of figured out, we now know what we're doing. God forbid we enter it. Now we've got a, a template, if you will, that we go, okay, this is what worked. And let's and continue. That template is needed when we think through, Gino Inc. did their April jobs report. 76% of all jobs in our area are going to require or do require some form of education, training, experience mm -hmm. beyond a high school diploma and yet 43 percent have a high school diploma or less in region one yeah. that's that's a complex <laughs> challenge so it is taking that same creativity reapplied in collaboration during covid and saying now let's tackle this yeah that's so right i want to i want to i want to go back just a few minutes before we get into that part i mean i do want to hit that part really well but Missy, did I hear you correctly that you said one in five quit? One in five healthcare workers across the U.S. quit. It was 18%, nearly one in five. Wow. I mean, that's just tremendous. Tell us a little bit about what that looks like in terms of changes to patient care and, and mm -hmm. some of what patients are suffering as a result of this problem. Yeah, and that's going to vary by how different hospitals have approached that shortage. So for a lot of us inside of Louisiana, we've supplemented with agency. So we've certainly had SNAP nurses come in through Louisiana supporting an additional surplus of nurses to be at the bedside. We've gotten creative in how we staff our hospital rooms to make sure that patient care is always 
kept at top level. So let's bring in more paraprofessionals. Let's bring in more certified nursing assistants, patient care assistants to ensure that the needs of the patient are being met. So there are ways that you do it, but it also means that you tend more to the whole person, which is a good outcome from all of this is you've recognized that well-being matters. Mental well-being, child care so that your team members can be there, and you had to find creative ways of addressing some of the barriers that might have caused somebody to leave the workforce. Yeah. So if somebody's overwhelmed, what do we need to do? Agency is expensive. Yeah, so I, I appreciate this collaborative care, what I would call a collaborative care model, right? This idea of getting um, a, a, a care team that is uh, going to have to work together and collaborate. That helps retention, obviously. Also, they see a sort of a continuum for advancement, which helps retention, obviously. But then in education, we need to be aware that, okay, there's a specific need. It's not just a credential that they need. They need a way of using that credential that's going to fit that workplace. So, you know, all of our simulations, for example, are done um, in an interdisciplinary fashion so that we realize, oh, this is a patient that we're surrounding with a particular kind of care. You know, it's not the um, ruptured spleen in room five. It's Mrs. Jones who needs this, 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 and this. And I'm a part of this vital team that's going to do it. And I have an understanding of what all of my teammates are responsible for, but I'm the expert in what I, I, I'm responsible for. And that sort of um, collaboration helps outcomes. It helps, but it also helps the continuity of care because it helps the retention of the, um, the caregiver in the um, particular uh, health care organization. Yeah, so I would it's think all interconnected. I would think that out there, like, it's, it takes some more time to get scheduled for procedures, you know, and this is just, you've got everybody from major healthcare systems down to much smaller clinics. New and, clinics, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, and, you know, I, I think that it, it, I've heard lots of stories with people that had to go in for a test or whatever, and, you know, a test that, isn't extremely urgent might be put off for a few weeks because you have to fit the more urgent cases in front of it. So it's really impacting, you know, um, you know, just the, the, the quickness of being able to be seen a lot. And I know that it's impacting people in rural areas, maybe a bit more than in big metropolitan areas. Is that, is that right? That is right, and if you think through many of our rural hospitals may already have had a challenge pre-COVID in attracting a workforce. And in this world where you can pay a premium for an RN to travel or for a respiratory therapist to go into travel, that may pull people away from those areas. So that just makes the challenge that much greater, and there's not a ready pipeline because many of our colleges for two years were on slowdown. So you didn't have the same numbers coming into a program. I'm sure Dr. Palermo can speak to this as can Dr. Holland is we've seen, and Dr. Holland will echo this, I'm sure, is we have a lot of openings in programs, but not necessarily a lot of applicants at this time. Hmm. So there is particular programs, right? Right. So what's the, what's the problem there? Um, you know, what's, is it a problem of getting the word out? or uh, I don't know. Just yeah, it's awareness. Yeah. It really is. Um, awareness in the younger ages, awareness among faculty in the K through 12s and among the advisors, the, the, the counselors in the K through 12, uh, understanding that healthcare is more than doctors and nurses. Uh, of course, doctors and nurses are critical, but there is there are high need <laughs> and high reward um, uh, fields, particularly respiratory and RAD are what we're seeing at the, um, the Bachelor of Science in Respiratory, as well as the Associates Level Respiratory programs throughout the state are under-enrolled and they're one of the highest need areas in the state. And many providers are starting to actually make those, um, uh, the, the compensation begin to compete with even entry-level nursing because they need 
the, the respiratory therapist so badly. Uh, so again, there's those partnerships then with the below higher education to get that awareness going. And, you know, one, uh, I want to do a shout out for one particular initiative here in Baton Rouge that um, I think is a great model for increasing awareness is the Baton Rouge Youth Coalition has something called um, Health Fellows. And they are looking at health from a very broad perspective, from health administration, allied health, um, even uh, pastoral um, support, and um, the business side of things, plus the other cl popular clinical kinds of fields, and at all levels from certificate clear through postgraduate kinds of um, preparation that's necessary. And it's a whole program where we educate talented high school kids from um, uh, more uh, marginalized populations to see, wow, what's out there for me and how I might be able to um, plug into our vast system of education here in, in uh, Louisiana to serve healthcare in some way that matches my talents and interests uh, and meet some of the highest needs that are um, existing right now. That kind of a model, I think, could be replicated throughout the state as a means of providing sort of homegrown um, awareness of these um, uh, high need but low enrolled um, programs. So I would like to chime in too because you know there is some great work being done with the Department of Ed and uh, with with normalizing that it's okay for students to enter a two year or a certificate or a technical diploma. So I think we you know we're starting to normalize that. There's still a lot of a room to grow in that space. But when everybody says, I want to go to college, maybe they're thinking, you know, in order to enter healthcare, you're, you know, the doctor, the nurse, you got to be that 4.0, 3.5 student GPA. But there is room for everybody pretty much to come into the community college two year system. There's, like you were saying, on ramp. So that's another thing, too. It's, 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 it's awareness, but it's also maybe cultural that, yeah. you know, whenever you think about going to college that and you think about healthcare, shifting your mindset to a sterile processor, mm -hmm. which can be a certificate, you know, surgical technologist, uh, respiratory therapist and an associate degree. And then also us knowing that they're a baccalaureate, we can cross walk them into a four year baccalaureate associate of applied science program at a four-year institution if that so there's room for them to it's there's room for everybody at a two-year because we can on-ramp them and then we also encourage them because but I agree with Tina it, it just seems like when you go to a high school gymnasium or you go they think of nurse which we have a different opportunity in nursing which would be to increase it capacity and what the programs can produce because you'll have so many qualified applicants to a nursing program, but not necessarily enough clinical faculty to support an increase in that enrollment. So either we need to funnel those would-be nurses to some of these other areas. That's it. And we do. We do. We, do. Uh, we definitely do that. But again, okay. when you are when you're growing up and you think healthcare, I think a lot of people in their the front of their mind goes does Tina goes leans towards that registered nurse yeah. or but maybe so, your your role is better as a surgical technologist or an EMT or you know a paramedic and, and there's there's tons of space that doesn't require uh, an associate's degree or a baccalaureate degree or a master's degree to enter the workforce and so that's probably where we're working at most Julie and working with a uh, great agency folks at the Department of Ed uh, and they're very supportive so I just want to put that out there too is something that we need to recognize and work work that together. that cultural piece is um, so powerful here in Louisiana in such beautiful beautiful ways and it's so powerful in such debilitating ways in, in, in so many aspects. Um, and when I came and felt that sense of dichotomy of college, no college, what finally came to mind was there is a very narrow understanding of what college means here in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. 
It yeah. means out of high school, go to a four-year school as a 19 or 18-year-old freshman, and then go, you know, do frat parties and football and beer, and then graduate and get a job with a bachelor's degree. And I'm, I'm thinking, no, you know, I, college is a much broader um, definition. College means getting that certificate uh, outside of high school. College means getting the, the, the two-year degree. College means going to work while you're getting the four-year degree. Well, the average age of the student at Fran U is 27. We don't, you know, we don't have residence halls because we expect um, that, you know, many of our students are going to be working while they're going to school. So it means a whole different model of education, a lot of uh, mentoring and care. And, and, and it different, takes me back to our provider support. Different ways to support college payments for those older students who are returning, because oftentimes they've already been at college once before. Maybe they have a earlier degree and they expend it. Hell, our tops and those opportunities are no longer afforded to them. Right. And taking out loans previously, they can't continue to take them out as they come in to pivot in their careers. So it's getting creative in how do we fund second career healthcare workers. That's, That's where the, the accelerated um, accelerated BSN is is a perfect example um, where we can get them uh, you know, we'll get a theology major, uh, get them some science prerequisites, and then in 18 months they they've completed their their RN, uh, their their with a BSN. Uh, but again that requires intense um, clinical experiences. Uh, we're talking right now with Ochner about, um, you know, what do you need to get master's prepared certified nurse educators because of the level of degree that we have, they need to be master's prepared. So, oh, does that mean we need to launch a nurse educator? We used to have a nurse educator um, uh, uh, track. Do we need to pull that back out of the mothballs and make that available to our community co um, college partners so that they can build up their faculty? Um, and we're talking with uh, one of our two-year schools um, right now about, you know, they're, they have a new uh, ASN program. All right. Can we help them grow their nurse faculty? And, and to that point, I think that's a challenge we face, not just in Louisiana, but in other areas where somebody to enter in as a college faculty member in nursing or in an allied health area may not be making teaching what they would be making if they were working in industry. So it makes it less enticing for somebody to get that master's degree to go ahead and enter that particular profession to teach the next generation. So we have a disconnect there. So we're looking at what are ways we can either buoy their salary so it matches what industry is paying, or do we fund for some additional adjunct faculty that we keep employed in the healthcare arena on their healthcare salaries but they can lean in to be clinical faculty within our colleges. And can we give them a clinical day where that full-time faculty member can work and earn clinical pay with a, um, one of our uh, hiring partners to yeah. boost that, that faculty salary? Um, there's also quality of life issues and hours, you know, the yeah. <laughs> floor nurses work their tails off. <laughs> Not the faculty don't, but so uh, well, Wendy knows the difference there. That's part of the, the thing that when, I, when I'm listening to you guys, what I hear is that one in five people have left the workforce. Okay, so where are they? And we have record unemployment, right? Record low unemployment. Right. So where are they? Where are they and what's the barrier, be it that they just don't want to go back to work? or they don't need to for whatever reason, or that there's just a barrier keeping them in another slightly different profession than what they're even certified for. What, what's going on there? It's a great question. I don't have the answer to it. I will say that what some of the challenges we see as we have 1,300 job openings right now for nursing and allied health. Now that's across 34,000 employees across the state of Louisiana. Yeah. And that's a very shallow pool because they're highly qualified technical workers you're looking for. And if they have opted out, then we're left with, do we go to agency or do we build our own? Do we partner with our college partners to build apprenticeship programs? Do we reach 
into our high school sooner to raise that awareness and build, but that's building for tomorrow. But right. where are they going today? Many have opted out because of uh, concerns over COVID, concerns over lack of flexibility in the workplace, over opportunities to sign on for something like Hobby Lobby at $18 an hour as a cashier when I could be working bedside, which job is easier? So some of it to Tina's point is quality of life. How am I choosing what I want? Hospitals are 24 seven operations. We also have had an increase in ability to work remote as a healthcare worker. I can now do telehealth. And that is something that has exponentially increased over COVID as people began to think through other ways of getting a clinic visit accomplished. So we're definitely seeing that there are more opportunities for people to choose a different way of applying more home health. That's yeah. another area where we've seen people move. Yeah. When I, um, a few months ago, it might be a little more than a few months ago now, but we had Kim Hunter Reed on here to discuss the MJ Foster Promise and her goals for, well, not just her goals, but the all of Regents goals for increasing the number of people with some kind of credential in our state. And when you look at the barriers that are out there, I mean, you've got new programs like the MJ Foster Promise, you know, in the four year environment, I know in UL system, um, there's the uh, Compete LA uh, to complete your bachelor's degree. Um, there's all these programs and, and Missy, I, I remember something in the legislature that's happening right now with a $25 million that's been funded to try to do some more workforce initiatives in healthcare. What was that again? And that is 25 million that HB1 has come in through the house to add to the rapid response fund. And that 25 million is a public private partnership funding matching dollars where a healthcare entity can partner with a Louisiana community technical college school and then collectively shape a program for workers to come through that program, come out on the other side and have a career pathway to a high wage job in healthcare at the end of a training program. That funding is going to last until 2026. So once it gets approved in June and we know the pathway, we'll see how that can help us to shape additional apprenticeship programs, additional nurses for our state to help meet the needs for the future. Right. So, you know, when you start to look at the barriers, because certainly through the MJ Foster Promise, through trying to help people through Complete LA, through this $25 million in the Rapid Response Fund, we're really working at bringing, like you kept saying, um, an on-ramp. Like we're providing the on-ramps. We just need to get that word out there to people. Um, what's the effort going on to get that word out to people right now? So I, I can take that. So we've already started a media campaign. If you're in the Baton Rouge or New Orleans area, you probably have seen billboards or uh, social media uh, on uh, ads and uh, on TV, there's commercials. And so we're rolling out region by region, but already the uh, MJ Foster Promise site on the LOSFA website is the number one uh, website that they have because we've had uh, close to 2,000 individuals already uh, apply to be a part of this because it is going to be run through LASFA, which is falls under the umbrella of Board of Regents. And so we're probably around 900 who are eligible because they have to fill out a FAFSA. So we're not, we don't start till July. So the first week or two that we rolled this out, it, we, we were prepared. We built this behind the scenes, uh, ready to uh, unleash media and press release. And so, so far, so good. We're, we're, we're still hoping that more, well, we feel confident that more are going to continue and, and ask students or maybe they're missing a, FOS, a FAFSA. You know, people are circling and they're helping them, you know, because it is a new process for some of our folks. And so that's very exciting and encouraging. So what I hear is that we're creating the on-ramps, we're getting the word out, but we're still left with some barriers to getting an education. And, you know, some of that is childcare. Um, you know, it's really, really convenient if you have the means to take off 
from whatever job you have at the moment to get that education, that you have somewhere to put your child while you get that education, that you've got transportation to that education. But there's so many factors that are working against the very people we need to be able to step forward. Um, and you know, what are we doing and what can we do to offset some of those barriers? Do we have any programs where we provide childcare while they're in school? Or are there any things like this that can help with those earnings while you're getting a, you know, your, your advanced at least certificate? Um, what can we do to grow and what are we doing? So I'm just gonna talk about LCTCS has done. Recently, we've had the Reboot Program. It's a Reboot Initiative where individuals can come in and earn a, a, a credential of value and they can, they can do that. And it's essentially almost no cost to them. And it was through that success that really also gave us uh, the, the MJ Foster Promise. Like we knew that we had success. So that just was the obvious next step for us. There's SNAP ENT where individuals who are receiving SNAP benefits have education and training uh, where that can come alongside them. And I, grassroots, I mean, we're talking uh, food pantries on site. Mm -hmm. You know, access to broadband during the during the pandemic, we were you know issuing out these um, these mobile hotspots and, and laptops and things that were were uh, we were able to do that through CARES dollars and there's HERF dollars. I mean, there was things that we were doing quickly to mobilize to come alongside and wrap our arms around these students because we they they wanted to be successful but broadband you know we we immediately recognize and and the state has come up and has supported an initiative for broadband our folks who live in rural areas you know believe it or not there are places in this state that you didn't have cell service so giving them a hot spot did them no good because they would still uh, we learned that, you know, it's good to offer things, but if their children are at home with them because school was canceled, how are they going to have time for to take an exam? And so we had, as faculty, we had to get real flexible that, you know, you couldn't just set an exam during a certain time of day because now they have children at home. So those are the, some of the things that we've just learned boots on the ground. Uh, Tina, I'm sure you've done some creative things as well uh, to come alongside this promote success for students. So it just just this week, um, you know, we're a relatively small school, so it's not unusual for me to get as the president involved in a specific student's situation. And I learned about a student who was struggling um, in uh, the undergraduate nursing program and learned that she was working 40 hours a week because she had to work 40 hours a week. And she was just, you know, there, it was inevitable that she wasn't gonna finish the program because she was just scraping by from day one and um, trying to balance. And when she could get the time off to, to make use of all the support services available to her and the extra tutoring and the mentoring and everything, she did well on exams. But then she had to work a long shift, then followed by an exam, of course, she didn't do well on the exam. And so we started thinking, you know, all right, so we're going to lose this student. We have to follow our, our policies. We're going to, we're not, the student's not going to be able to continue. What do we do? So um, making the faculty think about some tough questions like, do we want to offer part-time? They're so traditional in these cohorted programs. Do we want to offer part-time BSN nursing programs? Um, do we, how do, or do we want to offer some non-traditional hours when classes are being offered? Um, and at the same time, so there's that sort of work and school balance, but also look at the post-COVID um, high school grads who are now on average two years behind overall in coping skills, so in their overall emotional development, as well as the average learning loss. We're talking two years nationally. So I only wanna think what it is in a state that's already struggling, right? So we are uh, um, aggressively seeking um, private grant funding for extra student support services, emotional, academic, financial, and just throwing money at the problem and tuition support is just gonna be throwing good money after bad. 
we've got to invest money as um, as um, educational organizations in wraparound um, support services that are going to um, give us a better shot at success for each and every student. And that's labor intensive and that is um, uh, resource intensive. But we, we're trying to be as creatively resourceful as yeah, possible. It works. So I'm going to hard work. echo that we had a medical assistant training program with Delgado Community College. We had a young woman who was top of our program, unemployed, living in Section 8 housing with her two children, her mother and her father. Parents were incarcerated. She was evicted from the Section 8 housing because she was no longer on the lease. She's not on it. Parents were. So all of a sudden, this top of the class student starts yeah. failing. A very tuned in instructor leaned in to figure out what's going on. So not only are you teaching your program, now I'm a little bit of a case manager. Yep. What she discovers is the student is living in her car with a two-year-old and a three-year-old. And anyone who knows what it's like to try to study without a two-year-old or a three-year-old in a living room can appreciate how much more difficult it is to do so when you have no roof over your head but your car and you have the two-year-old and three-year-old needing mom. So uh, we have since that time invested in what's called the sustainable workforce model. We have a licensed clinical social worker at, through Greater New Orleans Foundation who provides those wraparound services to our workforce participants. And we try to make sure that that's a part of every workforce program we're doing that's helping to connect somebody who's been disconnected from work, unemployed, underemployed, back into the workforce, because those barriers, lack of childcare, transportation, housing, domestic violence, are very real and will cause somebody to drop from a program who is otherwise top of class. That young woman has since completed that program, She's gone on to get her master's. She's now working as an RN. And what you know is if you invest in the right remedies that can help to solve for these things early, somebody doesn't fall out of the system. Yeah, time is hard. hard. And we need hard. these people. We need them to be able to get these certifications and degrees. And it really behooves us to help them um, in every way, it doesn't benefit anybody for them to be trapped in a situation where they can't get an education, where they're living in a car and they can be top of their class, you know? So I always am encouraged to hear when, um, when industry and education and hopefully government too is working to try to help lift people out of these situations. The um, other way that we're approaching it from an employer perspective is we are betting big on apprenticeship and then certainly in high school pre-apprenticeship. The more students who are coming out with dual enrollment are coming out of high school with an industry-based credential ahead of departing high school, the better we are positioning them for one of those on-ramps we've spoken about. Right. We can get them in early, we can get them in and build them up, and then once they're working, we can do earn and learn time. So now we're paying you while you are training. So you're not having to quit work to go and do it, but it does require our academic partners to be flexible with us. So we have very much worked with Dr. Palermo and LCTCS to create flexible models. We'll be working with Tina on this as well, with Fran Yu on how do we get flexibility so that more working adults can continue to work, support their families, but still achieve their dreams. So Dr. Sparks, I'm going to interrupt because I know we're short on time, but I don't know that if you've heard this or not, but we've worked with the Louisiana Department of Ed, the, uh, the Practical Board of Nurse Examiners, and of course LCTCS and local superintendents to where um, they are going to uh, allow us to have nursing students, LPN students in high school. So they're... <laughs> So hot off the press, Julie, you've got it here. So um, yes, that is, we have a college right now who's already been approved, North Shore Technical Community College, BRCC is hot on their heels. Uh, they're dropping their application today. The, uh, the board, of course, is aware. They've been working with them and we have other colleges who are, they're, they are going as fast as they can because it, it is, you know, that is, a, that is an example of 
industry, education, and regulatory bodies working together to identify and remove barriers that make sense. So the goal at the time was instead of taking a student graduating from high school in May, entering you know, in August and then going 18 months, I mean, it'd be two years by the time they got out. But that the goal was for them to earn that IBC as an LPN student, as a senior, they could still earn that CNA, that stackable credential work if they choose and take in collects 12 months, they'll be eligible. There, that's the time that they graduate high school. That's the goal, but here's it, that's it. That's us trying to figure it out. We've never done this before. The PN board, I gotta give them some credit. They've been very supportive. They're going, okay, let's try it. So. And to a colleague's statement, never waste a good pandemic. It can help you to think <laughs> differently, help you to think creatively in ways that we have not before because we hadn't been tested to do so. So I see that we have opportunity embedded in the hardship that we've experienced the last two years that can help us to accelerate in new ways like this. And there's other examples, but that's the one that Missy doesn't know about. So I wanted to kind of unveil that to her today. <laughs> Well, you know, we're, we are running short of time. I did want to uh, ask Wendy in particular a, a question. Um, I heard that, you know, I don't know when this was, but recently uh, you developed and advocated for a, a plan to pilot something called medication attendance. Tell us a little bit about that particular innovation and how <laughs> that innovation's idea could be brought forward to help alleviate in other areas? Well, I mean, I can't take all the credit. I have to give some uh, shout out to Ms. Mignon Ader, who is the Dean of Nursing and Allied, uh, at Nursing and Allied Health at Central Louisiana Community Training College. She called me one day and said her industry partners wanted it. And that's what they needed me to do. And, and I was going to have to run that through rules and we're going to have to do all this work. And, and she said, I'll help you, but you know, I, you're going to have to do, help me. So I was brand new in the role at the system office. I was a dean for those who don't know. And I came to the system office to, to do work like that. So definitely did. It was right before the pandemic hit. This is in 2019. Had great success. Went through rules. No, no problem. Pandemic hit. Industry partners said, we're, we're, we're still here. Whenever, whenever we can, we want to continue. We opened the doors. I think that we were able to graduate in 2021. I think we started with a, a system. And what it did is it took existing CNAs who were working. They had, uh, they had to have at least a years of experience, came through our non-credit short term earned the credential of a medication attendant certified, but the LDH, and LDH was very supportive. I just want to come out and they were like very excited about this program. Certified them, put them on their own registry. And so that worked, right? And so then we started running them through, Central started doing it, North Shore started doing it. We, we got approved for all 12 colleges. They're, they're, they're working with their industry partners. It worked so well that the, uh, another, uh, uh, assisted living individuals reached out and said that they they want to do that so they reached out to their local legislators and uh, when it ran through the, I think it was through the house first of course you know uh, we watched it just just eagerly seeing if it would have did great zero nays just flew through the house because thank goodness for our legislators who who saw that there was a need the industry needed it. we had no problems when we ran it through so it worked and so why not expand it so i was just honored that i could be a part of that uh, that dark sullivan just trusted us that we saw a need and we met it and that they're taking it and running with it so lctcs is not only you know we we work but we're willing to expand more so that means more training and it's take it's a stackable credential cna and they're able to give you know medications uh to uh residents and those in living and assisted living to help get some of the burden off of the nurses it works um, i know we're, we're just about out of time so um i'm probably going to close it up unless somebody has some something that they're just they feel like they need to share before we sign off and everybody looks good so um you know i just really want to thank you guys for being here today it's been a great discussion at a pivotal time and um, i hope that this will help get the word out a 
to, to understand what's going on in our state and in our country too. And also to, to maybe get the word out to some people that, you know, need to find these sort of opportunities and that there are plenty of opportunities in the healthcare arena. And let's support our legislature in doing the things that it needs to do to get these programs and on ramps out there and then to alleviate some of the barriers that cause people to not be able to take advantage of them. But, um, you know, if you're watching this or listening to this today um, and you enjoyed it and you found it interesting, um, please share it on your social media and with your friends and family. Um, I'd also like to extend an invitation to those of you with a heart for policy in Louisiana to check out membership in Elevate Louisiana. You can find more information at www.elevatela.org. That's elevate with two L's, la.org. And finally, um, we are planning our third annual summit. It will be in the fall. Um, the dates are a little up in the air, but we are planning it in New Orleans. Uh, we're gonna blow it out of the park. It should be a super informative time. So keep an eye on our website to find out when that's gonna be. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.